I'm talking today to those who are learning to do qualitative research. So by now, you're apoplectic. What is this business? You are telling me that there is no standardized set of instructions for how to do qualitative analysis. And there are multiple interpretations possible. And that it is up to the researcher's creativity and imagination and cannot be done by machine or by plugging in a set of procedures. So what do you do? You might have heard that you, that you, that you are supposed to start hunting for themes, some sort of regularities that run through the data. Themes, however, are not just perched out there waiting for you to call. They are not self-evident. Because, because of this, qualitative researchers may tend to end up sorting the data into pre-existing concepts, categories, and frameworks, which does not take them very far beyond what is already known and gives them little purchase on the data. Qualitative research requires the ability to see, to see into, through, around, and beyond your data to see what is there in different ways, to conceptualize what you are seeing in general abstract terms that transcend the immediate empirical observations. Although I cannot, in this short lecture, uh, teach how to see in any depth, I can give you examples of what I call analytic devices, strategies or tricks of the trade, as Howard Becker calls them, for reading asking questions of and reflecting on your data in ways that allow you to see your material in new ways and from different angles, and to move beyond surface meanings to more abstract general concepts and framings. It is critical to know that analytic devices do not themselves do the analysis. They only enable the researcher to think analytically, to conceptualize. One analytic device is to conduct multiple layered readings. This is where you read through pieces of data, like an interview transcript, for example, multiple times, each with a different purpose and focus. Depending on your project, for example, you could read the transcript looking to see how a particular phenomenon is experienced by the subject. A second reading might focus on how the subject locates him or herself in terms of identity and group membership. A third read might concentrate on identifying evidence of a broader social discourse that is embedded in the words and the narrative. In each, you are alert to different aspects of the text, of the context. Another device uh, is to read for what is not said, for silences, for absence, for what is between the lines. What is unsaid can be important as what is said. Another device involves examining how people tell their stories. The narrative form and content of their accounts can tell us much about how they conceive the world and their position in it. For example, do subjects frame their stories as battles to be fought and won or lost? Do they represent themselves as self-sufficient heroes or as powerless victims? The narrative structure of what people say, quite apart from its actual content, has a lot to tell us and itself is data that calls for interpretation. Perhaps the single most important analytic device, in my view, is the use of comparison. This refers to the continuous effort to understand phenomena by comparing them to others in deliberate, systematic ways. This can be formally part of the research design or done as part of a cognitive exercise. It involves comparing things that are alike in some respects, but not all, in order to tease out what key properties are in operation. For example, I once studied with some colleagues the nature of healthcare work done in private homes. We went into the homes of chronically ill and disabled persons to see what the physical and social working environment was for caregivers. Although the study only included care in homes, the constant comparison of what we saw with what we knew of healthcare delivered in hospitals allowed us to see home as a place with no lifting machines, no health and safety regulations, bathroom doorways too small for wheelchairs to fit through and for carrying people into and so on. <clears throat> you are likely to have heard of coding and may think of it as the primary analytic procedure of qualitative research. It may or may not be, but the important thing about coding is that it is a device that brings things into view that forces you to try to conceptualize your data. Coding in qualitative analysis is not a rigid classification system that applies labels devised beforehand. Rather, it is an organic process that develops as you go along that requires constant analysis. Codes are constantly changed, refined, dumped, 
linked to other codes, and ultimately they morph into concepts and findings. The coding process itself is a very important analytic device for making sense of your data. Codes, though, are not the end product of qualitative analysis. They are a device for achieving analysis. A spotting data that appears to be contradictory or counterintuitive can trigger important analytic insight. The trick is to look for and be able to see what is surprising to you or not what you expected and to use it as a springboard for inquiring into how and why it might be so. Contradictions or surprises flag sites of exploration. Here the device is about being attentive to metaphors in the data. For example, in one of my projects studying injury and illness and prevention in small workplaces, I noticed a pervasive use of the idea that small, businesses, small business was like a family. It became a key code that enabled me to investigate how it was being used and what its implications were for health and safety. And then it emerged eventually as a core concept for understanding the nature of work life in small businesses. Another important analytic trick is to consider everything as data not just the formally collected stuff like interview transcripts or observations or written documents. In qualitative research, there are endless possibilities for what can tell you something about your phenomenon of interest. Tone, bodily posture, gestures, clothing, images, documents, tombstones, graffiti, clinical files, advertisements, you name it, it tells us something about how and why people think and do what they do and about the social forces operating through them. But you have to see things as data to be able to capitalize on them as knowledge. For example, in one of my studies of small workplaces, I could tell a lot about the social relations between employers and workers by looking at the boss's fingernails. If they were dirty, it often indicated that he worked on the shop floor alongside his workers, which was significant to this study. The inability to reach employers by phone after 7 o'clock in the morning was not just a recruitment nuisance, but it was also data in that it signaled the hours and patterns of doing work and communicating in the industry. Retroactive reasoning is another device for making sense of data. The trick is to ask yourself what has to be for your observation to make sense. What must be believed or thought for people to say or do what they do? An example of this comes from an ethnographic study of the health care of stroke patients in a general hospital many years ago that I did. I observed that in the hospital halls and physiotherapy gym, stroke patients in wheelchairs were often left facing walls or in positions that indicated that the person putting them there did not think of them as sentient, interacting human beings. This was an important indicator of the way the clinical staff thought of stroke and stroke patients and was a clue to understanding how they treated them. Another device uh, is to use your own reactions to the phenomenon of study as a resource for interpreting data. For example, in the study of the care of stroke patients I just mentioned, I noticed that everyone seemed to talk about stroke patients in very gloomy, hopeless ways in the staff room and halls. But in face-to-face -face contact with them, with stroke patients, they were bright and perky and optimistic. In trying to figure out why this was so, I drew in part on my own reactions when I went into the room with a stroke patient and found myself doing the same thing. Interrogating the reasons for my own response helped me to understand what was going on, which ultimately grew into an analysis of the role in healthcare of what I called shooting the breeze. The active role of the researcher as research instrument is a big difference from positivist science where the researcher is seen as bias and must be rendered invisible in the interests of objectivity. In qualitative research, the role of the researcher is not only acknowledged, but put into active service in the analysis. Another uh, uh, analytic device uh, involves forays into literatures external to the field uh, you, are, you are in. Um, as you begin to conceptualize your data, it is typically very helpful to read around in adjacent and far-flung areas in search of ideas that help you make sense of your data. For example, a student of mine, Liz Mansfield, has been studying uh, a workplace injury prevention initiative that used true account testimonials of families of young workers killed on the job. 
she began to read what was known about the use of memorials more generally and their social functions, and it enabled her to see things she had not seen before in her data and gave her important conceptual fuel for explaining empirically what happened in the prevention program. Another important analytic device in qualitative analysis is to write. We write analytic memos all the way along, and then we write the final report. You don't collect your, your data and analyze it and then write it up. To write is to analyze. Writing constitutes analysis. For example, to write, you have to know the main point. Know what the central story is you want to tell. You have to integrate and align all your findings in relation to the core story. Doing this is very difficult, but exceedingly important. If you don't do it, you will end up with a catalog of observations, quasi-digested, with no overriding analysis, no value added. So finding the story in your data is an analytic task. In writing, your choice of words is never neutral. Words represent your subjects or situations in particular ways. Depending on the words and grammar you use, you portray people as, for example, ignorant unfeeling, self-absorbed, or as the exact opposite. Thus, in writing down anything, when you start to write, you are forced to confront how you are interpreting the data, how you are conceiving your subjects, uh, and what it is you want to convey. So these, then, are some of the analytic devices that can be used. It's important to remember that the devices operate not by producing analytic outputs themselves, but by opening the researcher's eyes to different properties of the phenomenon and to different analytic possibilities. Analytic devices do not themselves produce analysis. Mm -hmm.